If you're optimizing everywhere, you're optimizing nowhere. All right, guys, welcome back. And again, thanks for all the comments. Some really, really good comments, guys. And I see people are understanding um, this induction. We get some really, really smart people in the comments. Uh, we get some really uh, silly comments from time to time. But uh, yeah, really, really good engagement. Uh, today, I wanted to talk about that. Uh, if we optimize everywhere, we optimize nowhere. And, and this feeds into a few questions we had about induction, uh, variable length induction, uh, what we should choose, uh, meaning should we choose a shorter straighter runner or a longer bent runner? So something that's got a bend at 90 degrees or something that should be uh, straight. Uh, and this feeds into what we've talked about before. Um, priority of command, Where what area is more important than the next area? We've done this about the induction length before, uh, the seat and the uh, discharge coefficient, so the, the chamber shape is the most important. And as we go to the bell, that's the least important. So uh, most to least. And when it comes to intake design, uh, we have two major factors that come into play when we're talking induction length. We have our wave tuning. You've heard me talk about the third harmonic and getting the induction length to the third harmonic. And then we have our inertial supercharge mechanism. And that's that inertia we've been talking about right through the porting series about sizing the port right, getting the CSA right to optimize the airspeed to create as much weight as possible without losing it to density losses. So um, that molecular collision gets too high, uh, we start making friction, we start making heat, the boundary layer swells and the engine chokes and signs off. So it's all a balance and uh, it, it's a bit of a, a hill. So as, as we, um, tighten up cross-sectional area will make more and more and more then we'll fall off the curve, right? So we've got to get it right. And that's where inertial supercharging is probably the most important. But when I talk about uh, priority systems, what, what we have to prioritize always is inertial supercharging over wave tuning. And you see this with all the aftermarket manifolds out there, all the all the uh, single planes and stuff like that. They aren't harmonically optimized, really. Well, fourth, fourth harmonic, but not third. Uh, but all your billet type stuff with short runner, what they're doing to compensate for the short runner is they're nipping the CSA. Again, it won't perform as well as a true third harmonic at the right length, uh, like we sit, like we do when we do our uh, intakes for like super stock and stuff like that. But they're optimizing the inertia part. So they're generating velocity much sooner in the runner and they're using that to their benefit. And that comes down to the math uh, again. So what, the wave tuning is worth versus what uh, inertia supercharging is worth. The best we're going to see is around 5 to 7% on top of our volumetric efficiency for wave tuning. Whereas uh, inertia supercharging is going to be sort of 16 to 20%. So it, it's worth double and some, um, you know, at least three times more. Uh, so, and, and I'll explain why we want to prioritize um, inertia supercharging and why the struggles we've had around um, variable length induction. Because you get a lot of people coming into the industry fresh and, you know, the dimple port thing comes up like they've found some, um, you know, magic bullet to making horsepower. And um, variable length induction is another one that comes up and I've, I've engaged many of people about this and the limitations to it. Uh, where where it can work in circuit racing, uh, in rotaries, uh, mainly because they don't have a rising piston, uh, so they're more about wave tuning. Uh, we're seeing that in the Mazda Le Mans um, 787B, I think it is, or B787, someone put it in the comments. Um, and, and that's because they have a, obviously a horrible short turn. They're, they're almost turning 90 degrees into their housings. Um, and yeah, they're, 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 they're not a 
not a great, um, you're limited with velocity. Uh, so we can optimize a little bit of wave tuning on them. But where the struggle comes into, and we've gone into this into the induction series is, generally to have a variable length. So this is different to what some of the bikes run with a dual uh, setup. So they'll have a tapered runner on a smaller tapered runner and the top one lifts out of the way. So that way they've got a longer runner and then the second stage is a shorter runner. So it's not true variable length, uh, but it's a better system because they're still keeping a taper, they're still keeping a nice velocity gradient, they still have a Venturi shape, where to get a slide system, we have to run parallel tubing. So straight away, our friction coefficient, our drag factor, the thickness of our boundary layer is all working against us. So we've, we, and because we've got to size it some way. So if our choke is the only area that's having peak velocity, that's giving away a little bit of density because that molecular collision is the highest here, whether it be a new style or even an older style where the pinch was at the window or the MCA or wherever you want to say it was, um, they, they're still a Venturi shape and that is the best and least amount of restriction of any induction shape we, we can have. And, and on Einstein, we've shared studies, uh, even with uh, aerodynamic studies and also induction studies about convergent and divergent angles and what are the least and most restrictive. And in, in um, uh, aerodynamics, the um, divergent angle really doesn't matter, but induction, it's very, very important. And you'll know that through our induction series we've talked about, as we increase RPM, we're increasing this angle or at least increasing the CSA as we change the length of the induction. That's because we have a volume factor that we're trying to feed that, that gulp mechanism. So we want our induction to be up around about that, um, you know, 92, 95% of cylinder volume, right? So as we increase RPM, the runner shortens, we've got to widen this and also we've got to compensate for the airspeed at the bell. So we know there's a taper factor that changes with RPM. So as we increase RPM, we need more taper. And again, this is uh, feeding into if we're on a true third harmonic. If you've got a manifold where you're limited to run a length, then we can nip that CSA up. So let's say um, the engine's 7,500, the optimal runner length is 14 inches from the valve to the bell. So the manifolds, um, let's say it's nine inches, but we can only fit four or five. And at that 7,500, the optimal angle is three degrees or, or, or five degrees. Just let's pick a number. What do we do if we've only got a four to five inches? Well, now we can close that up to one and a half degrees and that will increase our velocity and feed our inertia supercharging mechanism because that's now priority, not wave tuning. And we'll still uh, make um, probably within 10, 12% of uh, a fully optimized because we're, we're still using that inertia supercharging mechanism. We're just not using it over its true length and we don't have our wave uh, tuning aspects there. So we're losing that five or 7% straight up. But as you've seen between uh, single carb and tunnel ram, the horsepower difference again is maybe eight, 10%. So again, this isn't a lot, but it's about optimizing the whole picture. So we know that this is the shape and we know that as soon as we introduce something like this, we've lost so many aspects that we no longer can control, like taper, volume, uh, our uh, restriction, our density. So we're gonna lose a lot more density. We're gonna have a lot more turbulence in this. And this is why if you look at um, people that have done induction tests online where they've just put parallel tubes and they just cut the tube down and dyno the engine and, and try and work it out that way. That's not a true way of under, uh, knowing what the optimal runner length is because even the volume will change 
what your optimal length is. This is why some of the calculators will actually have a CSA or volume input, generally a CSA. Now, and that's because the volume is also going to dictate the frequency of, of your induction system, even though the, the speed of sound isn't going to change dramatically. But we're going to have some density shift. Uh, and obviously, we've talked about this before. Density really isn't the problem, but temperature is. So we need to keep an eye on that. And this is where stuff like this becomes a problem because the temperature gradient across the induction system is so much higher than something like this. Right, we're losing density in parallel tubes. We don't in, or not don't, but the least amount of density loss is in something like a Venturi shape for, for that design, right? So these are all things we have to think about uh, when designing uh, induction. So the problem becomes that we, we end up prioritizing torque uh, and we don't develop that error under the curve where we need it. So in drag racing, we're only that 1500 to 2000 RPM. So we can use a variable length induction, get a really, really wide power range, but our error under the curve for what we're doing just isn't there. Where if we optimize it here and we're 20% up on horsepower, that's taking an 800 horsepower engine to a thousand horsepower. And now that error under the curve versus this error under the curve is far more. So this is why I say, if you're optimizing everywhere, you're optimizing nowhere. Sure, variable length cam timing and all that helps, but a, a CSA, so that induction, only works right at one RPM. Same as a camshaft, same as anything, especially in fixed engines like V8s and stuff like that that don't have variable uh, cam timing. And even variable cam timing only gets you so far because variable cam timing isn't going to compensate for the induction changing. If we could have a variable tapered and length runner, that'd be unreal, but uh, I don't think anyone's there. Um, that would be the goal, but uh, like I said, no one's actually doing that. So we have to face reality. And with drag racing or anything like that, we're only talking about narrow windows. So we want to get the most amount of error under the curve. So we want to prioritize we want to use both, but we want to prioritize inertia supercharging over just wave tuning. We can optimize the wave tuning at every RPM with a parallel induction, but it's not going to give us the horsepower uh, that we need. It's not even going to give us the torque, and that's because we're going to lose it in density. We're not going to get that density back. We've talked about this in other videos about um, um, uh, density losses through turbulence, through um, wall interaction, surface RA. So dimples are a great example of um, um, frictional losses that are far too high. Their convection mechanism is three to 500% higher than a burr finish. So they're just putting far too much heat into the system. So we're losing that kinetic energy to heat and we can't get it back. So something to think about. Um, so yeah, guys, basically, the right induction will generally win everywhere. And again, we see this in motorsport. This is why you know, pro stock, super stock, or the top NA cars, um, Dave and his Honda stuff, they're all using tapered runners, um, fixed runner lengths, and just optimizing that area um, under the curve where we need it. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's probably the most important thing. Anyway, guys, in our next video, we're going to talk about valve seats. We've had some questions about valve seat throat sizes, uh, valve seat angles. So we might cover that and get into it a little bit more. Cheers, guys. See you in the next one.